He loved it. Oh, really? Yeah, he loved it. It's a beautiful author. Yeah. Okay. Like so let's go on and we'll talk about the, the labrum and FAI today. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ashley, why don't you go ahead and take this down? Okay. Um, 29 year old female. Just looking at the. Okay. We have a CT here, the hips. Um, oh, the, Looks like there might be some. I don't know what the center lateral edge angle is, but I'd like to see it. It looks kind of different on both sides. This one looks like hip dysplasia, right? Yeah, looks like. Yeah, it looks like hip dysplasia right there. To do that, and the patient shows a little irregularity here. The labrum, but again, I, I don't I don't find ultrasound to be a, a very, in our hands, uh, valuable technique for evaluating uh, labral tears. So let's talk about labral tears, let's talk about standard imaging and MRI imaging. In the early days, uh, uh, this is early MR scans, we could see the case was uh, a little uh, labral tear, really uh, this was in the late 1980s. Uh, and then we started doing arthrography to look for the, these tears. And here we can see the, the superior labrum over there. And this is an axial view of a little bit of the posterior labrum. And the one thing to realize is that there's some normal variance here, especially in the posterior labrum, where you can get a normal separation between the very inferior labrum and the acetabulum called the sulcus. Just one second here. Hi, John. Where are you? Okay, so so this is just called a, a sulcus, and uh, this is what it looks like on at arthroscopy. We have nice smooth surfaces without any jagged or irregularity, and this is called a, a normal variant. And it's very common involving the uh, posterior inferior aspect of of the labrum. So I'd be very careful calling labral tears in this location unless it's very irregular, unless you have clear evidence of significant. Uh, uh, femoral tabular impingement, which we'll, we'll go through shortly. Okay, Jennifer. Okay, so we have a 32-year-old male with right groin pain. Um, here we can see some contrast signal intensity along the chondrolabral junction of the superior labrum, but I don't see any full thickness extension through the labrum. And no paralabral cyst. Yeah. Yes. And then here we have the arthroscopic correlation and also the axial images. On the axial images, superiorly, we can see that cleft of contrast um, there, that linear cleft. And then it looks like on arthroscopy, they're showing us a tear of the labrum. Yeah. And uh, th this was called a, uh, a chondrolabral detachment or a superior labral tear, uh, and it's a cause of some instability. Uh, the, the issue up here, you can also get normal chondrolabral separations here uh, or clefts uh, in the superior labrum as well. And when they're very smooth like this, uh, the majority of the time the arthroscopist will call these uh, a normal variants. So, when you see this, I would describe it and say it's most likely a uh, chondrolabral separation, but a, uh, a congenital chondrolabral uh, defect, but a label tear cannot be excluded. If you see it going all the way through, as we see in these, then, then that's a evidence of a tear, and not just a, a normal variant. So on the, the one that Jennifer was doing, that, that you don't know either, right? It could have been either. Yeah, the, the, this is one. Uh, this one's a little bit more prominent than normal. It's a little bit wider than a typical congenital version. So this one, I would be highly suspicious that this is a tear. So I would probably call this one a tear. If we come here, where these, this is a much smaller one. You don't see as prominent one. And this one, I would be, I would uh, hesitate and call this probably a, uh, a congenital uh, uh, meniscal labral defect. Where's John? He hasn't joined us. 
Uh, if it goes all the way through like this, this actually is the same patient. So this is a tear uh, <clears throat> on this particular patient. And then here we see it. Here we can see a, another. This looks more like a tear too. It's not as smooth as a prior one. It looks like it really contrasts going into an irregular portion of the of the labrum. And here we can see the irregularity arthroscopically on this one. Another name for this is called a sublabel sublabel sulcus. It's in uh, about a quarter of the population, so it's quite common. Uh, common posteriorly and anterior inferiorly. Smooth contours, limited depth, and, and lack of secondary abnormalities like paralabial cysts. Okay, I'm going to stop here just for a second and see if I can get your goodness on. Okay, uh, so Michael, you want to do something? Yeah. It's a 44 year old overweight female with chronic right hip pain. So they're just looking there on the uh, anterior labrum. It looks like there's a either fluid or contrast signal undercutting the labor at the condolabral junction. And I'm not sure if it's complete, but it looks somewhat deep. Um, the posterior labrum, I think, looks okay. So I'd be concerned for a tear, but it's hard to tell. I'd look for paralabral cysts, other slices, to see if it goes all the way through. Oblique axial. So looking at the superior labrum up there, I didn't see anything. I don't see a paralabral cyst, but on the sagittal, it looks like there's that Defect looks a little more irregular, I would argue. I would, I might suggest that it could be a tear. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't if I were you. I noticed this is the transverse ligament, and this is right next to the transverse ligament, uh, far posterior area. This is not an area where you typically will get labral tears. Uh, almost all labral tears that are least significant are superiorly or anterior tears. This is posterior, and this is a very, very common location where probably the most most people will have a little uh, contralabral separation, which is a normal recess. So the normal recesses occur really anteriorly, infer uh, inferiorly, uh, and posteriorly, inferiorly. They're kind of linear shape. They're little partial separations. Absence of paralabral changes such as cysts, bony changes, and cartilage injury, and and those are pretty normal recesses. So I, I'm uh, hesitant to call labral tears if they're not in the typical superior and anterior superior locations. If you do, just just uh, I would say that uh, this could be a congenital variant. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and the differential, and then the, the arthroscopists will have to make the decision whether they want to do arthroscopy or not. And if they do, for that reason, they have they need to inform the patient that it, it may just be a normal variant, but because of whatever's happening clinically, they feel that arthroscopy is indicated. And then, then they won't be upset if they do a whole surgery based upon a false positive. Okay, that's you. So there's some irregularity of that anterior superior labrum right there. I think it goes all the way through. I'd be worried about a tear. There might even actually be a small paralabral cyst, but maybe right there, yeah, with the arrow. Labral tear, yep. And uh, here's another typical example of an anterior labral tear with a little tiny paralabral cyst associated with it in that location, and this was a documented labral tear. Okay, uh, okay uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? Okay, so we have a coronal image of the left hip, and I don't see any abnormal signal intensity along the superior labrum, and then here it looks like we're kind of through the mid joint space so the, the, this line shows where this oblique axial image was obtained right so that small cleft of increased signal anteriorly i think is just where that transverse ligament comes up and attaches i think we're too far down for a labral tear and that's what i would say too most of the time i don't see a paralabral cyst i don't see bone and reactive changes so this is one that i would call most likely a congenital uh uh chondral labral uh defect in this location this patient was arthroscoped and they actually thought that this was an actual tear but uh i i think that's unlikely 
in most situations for these kind of findings to be tears. So I agree with you. Okay, Michael. Okay, so on the T1 fat set post, uh, it looks like involving the superior labrum, we can see some contrast, linear contrast signal. It looks like it extends through kind of the mid portion of the superior labrum completely. And then there's some contrast superior to that along the acetabulum, which is probably a paraliberal cyst filling with contrast. And it looks like it's larger along the edge. So it just looks like a superior liberal tear. Okay, hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> um, I think there's a paralabral cyst extending superiorly there, so I, I would say that there's probably a non-visualized tear. Right there, okay. Okay. Yeah, so, see why in the early days, uh, it, uh, people pressed to get arthrography uh, when they did hips, because it was hard with the technology we had to get the right coils in order to be able to do high-resolution local coil imaging. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, now we have much better quality imaging, and I th I don't think we need most of the time we need to do arthrography of the hips looking for significant labral tears uh, with today's technology. Some the, people would disagree with that. Is it just the um, the, way, uh, the acquisition is, or is there coxavara deformity and frank deformity of the femoral neck there? Almost like, or is that just? I would not be willing to call that on these small fields. This, I'd like to see a larger field of your image. Okay, Jennifer. Okay, so this is a 30-year-old female with left sciatica. And it looks like on the axial images, there's a conglomeration of possible paralabral cyst along the posterior acetabulum, kind of a budding the sciatic nerve, um, so I'd want to evaluate further for a labral tear. Yeah. So this patient had a labral tear, had a paralabral cyst. It was pressing on the sciatic nerve, and it was producing classic sciatica symptoms uh, in this patient. So if you do, fortunately, the posterior labral tears are pretty uncommon. But if you have a large uh, paralabral cyst in this location, you can get uh, symptoms along the uh, sciatic nerve. Okay, um, so the bottom stir image is just showing like some signal along the, like on the along the neurovascular in the region, the neurovascular bundled up. The doctor, and um, I'm not sure what the arrows. Like I can't really see what the left arrow is pointing to on the other side. Is that just showing asymmetry? Like, okay. And look, I mean, it looks like there's this little small cystic structure, like right where the obturator is going on. Okay. So there's a small like cystic structure along like the obturator kind of pathway, but that's not, which I'm really not sure where it's arising from. So, so this is a. Paralabral cyst that actually extended here produced a like we see cysts on the shoulder. Uh, here's one that's uh, producing a neuropathy around the hip. Uh, I've never seen this, but uh, as you can see, it's been described. Um, so it there's, looks like there's irregularity of that posterior labrum. Um, yeah. I, it does. It doesn't look like it goes all the way through, but um, it looks really irregular. So I would call this a tear. But, but without evidence of a of a paralabral cyst, right? Jennifer. Again, we have left sided sciatica, and we see this conglomeration of cysts along the left. Posterior acetabulum, and okay, there's a thin tail connecting to the adjacent left acetabulum, suspicious for paralabral cyst. And then coming down further, we can see a tear 
of the posterior labrum with joint fluid extending. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh. Yeah. Here again, we can see the paralabral cysts abutting the sciatic nerve yeah. and causing sciatica. Right hip pain, real labral tear. Um, so we see on the right, there's a fairly decent size uh, joint effusion. It's a large field of view, but I'm wondering if I'm seeing some fluid signal right there at the chondrolabral junction superiorly. But I guess on the left side, it looks like that might be symmetric. So, and now we have a. Uh, so an arthrogram, it looks, you know, that undercutting signal kind of looks like cartilage signal. It doesn't look like bright contrast right there. So I'm wondering if that's just kind of cartilage undercutting and that you could get fooled that it's a tear. So this was a chondral junction irregularity and uh, was not a tear. So like you can see, so you have to, you can see, and one thing is, here's, you can get symmetric tears, but it's uncommon to have tears that are this symmetric. Whereas when you have these chondrolabral irregularities or chondrolabral defects, they're almost always symmetric. So that can be helpful sometimes. Uh, let me see. I guess we'll go ahead. If we go further here, this this what this patient actually had was the tear of the iliotibial band here. And that was causing their, their symptoms. Um, looks like there's extensive marrow edema of the femoral neck on the left. I don't know if that's, we're looking for a stress fracture there. Um, a lot of artifact here. I'm not quite sure. That looks like a normal defect at the transverse ligament. I wouldn't call it tear there. But um, uh, it looks irregular, actually. It's kind of irregular. I mean, I guess you can so, get injury so to that. Okay. And it showed a lot of bone injury. And this was, this is not proven surgically, but this was thought to be a partial tear of the transverse ligament. But it was treated conservatively. Jennifer? We have a 42-year-old male with hip pain for one year. Uh, let's see. There's some increased signal there in the region of the ligamentum teres. Okay. Not sure if this could represent strain. Um, well, here it looks like it's, it's actually, still. It's actually a complete tear. It looks like it's oh, torn. Okay. That's hard to tell there. Thanks for joining us, John. But yeah, this is just one cut. You'd have to see all the cuts. Uh, but this this was a complete tear of the of the ligament. It's kind of balled up there, and you can and it uh, uh, we don't see it going into the fovea in this case. So this was a complete the ligament of Terry's tear. Sixteen year old male with right hip pain and multiple prior negative MR arthrograms. Um, so I think what we're looking at is kind of on the inferior, pretty inferior labrum. It looks like there's some contrast signal um, on or fluid sensitive signal right there, kind of at the. So, so this, this is this is I mean yeah because we're getting to the level of like the ligamentum teres, but it looks a little irregular the along its. That, sorry, when I said ligament, I meant transverse ligament. Um, like at the where the transverse ligament kind of its junction right there looks a little irregular on the 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 stir sequence, and there is like a cystic, you know, somewhat it's not paralabral but kind of like paratransverse ligament type cyst. I don't know if you call it that, but that's what it. And um, I mean, I assume it could just be a, and that looks just like a really thickened. Uh, uh, ligament that might just be tendinotic. Uh huh. And does the labrum look normal to you, John? Yeah. So. 
That's the previous the previous one. That's the other case. So so the ligamentum teres also looks kind of thick and irregular, but I think it's intact. So John, the only uh, labrum we see up here is a superior labrum, and that looks pretty good to me. I think the problem is down here inferiorly. Around well, uh, that's what I was looking at. Is that part of the labrum where, uh, where that's right? The cyst is right, right below it. Yeah, there's no labrum inferiorly here. Yeah, well, then that, that's. <laughs> yeah, the, the 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 you know the labrum is superior, it goes anterior and posterior, but inferiorly the labrum stops. And instead, you have the transverse ligament. Transverse ligament. I, it, it, that that doesn't look normal to you, though, though does it? No, I, all this cystic stuff around here is not normal. So, Mike, yeah. tell us what's happening. And, and it's a thing yeah. rolled, uh, I'm if there was it is, uh, transverse ligament injury and kind of, you know, formation of cysts. A 16-year-old um, to get a cyst. If there was trauma, it had to be something very significant, i.e., like a dislocation or something. I, I, so I assume this is like an analog of like a paraliberal cyst, but involving the transverse so ligament. They operated on this patient. The transverse ligament here was intact. What they found, however, was that the ligament in teres down here was. Uh, uh, partially torn, and all these cysts were coming from the ligamentum teres. That, 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 that looks like a ligamentum teres, that, that old. Yep. But uh, how does that happen in a 16-year-old, unless it was a trauma? What you see in the ligamentum teres on the coronal looks okay, right? Right through here. Yeah. Um, okay. Why do you say it looks okay? I'm not sure that does to me anyway. But you, you've probably seen more of these than I have yeah. by far. Yeah. I'm sure. And, and it may be a little, the, lig the ligament of may be a little bit thickened right at the fovea. Uh, yeah. A little bit uh, uh, more inferiorly here, it's normal, but it's abnormal when we get to to a peripheral insertion there. So this was, this was all cystic disease coming from a partial tear of the ligamentum teres. The lig ligamentum teres isn't that long, is it, than most folks? Uh, well, no normally, normally we can see it very nicely here. Here's another case where we can see the ligamentum teres. Yeah. But, but as you go to the right uh, direction, and as, as the tablet, yeah. Well, that that's got me a little confused. Okay. So, a 16 year old female sprinter who recently took up cross country gra gradual anterior superior hip pain rule out labral tear. The anterior superior labrum actually looks, I thought, looks okay. Um, but I'm looking inferiorly there. Yeah, inferiorly though, it that, you know it kind of looks like the prior case um, where there, although the ligamentum teres looks fairly thin. Doesn't look too bad. Um, okay, so you is this an is it arthrogram or just a stir? So we do have a hip effusion here. Um, it almost looks like there's some fluid there along the capsule margins, and I don't know if there could be a capsular injury because it doesn't look intact there. Yeah, right. I mean, depending, yeah, I mean, since this is fluid and not an orthogram, I'd be worried about capsular injury. Oh, okay. So they could have just went through it. Yeah, I think that it'd be hard to. Yeah. It was, okay. Actually, another reason why I'm not a big fan of arthrography, because I think the arthrogram is, it puts this into a big question and can be a problem uh, evaluating uh, these kind of lesions. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, so that could have easily been extravasation or injection of contrast into the capsule.
Uh, Jennifer. <clears throat> okay, this is a study from October 2003. There is some increased signal, contrast signal at the chondral labral junction of the superior labrum. Uh, I think this could be concerning for a tear of the superior labrum. There's a little bit of irregularity of the adjacent bone here, uh, which makes me a little bit more suspicious than if the bone were entirely normal. Okay, this is now a few years later. So a couple years later, now it, I don't see that contrast signal, but it seemed like there might be a little blunting of the labrum. So I wonder if this reflects quella prior labral injury. Well, yeah, this patient had a, a debridement of the labral tear and now has and had a, some iliofemoral ligament resection and now has a kind of insufficiency of the iliofemoral ligament here and some instability of the, of the hip. And that's like a meniscectomy complete. Yeah. So nowadays, instead of doing uh, uh, debridements like this, they typically will try to do a labral repair because those have been shown to have better outcomes. And with modern techniques, it's very uncommon to get these uh, capsular uh, defects. Okay. Uh, probably age dependent. So we just have a zoomed in uh, radiograph of the left hip. Um, first, I'll just look at the acetabular coverage. I think looks okay. Um, I guess the circles are showing this kind of lucency at the superior femoral head neck junction, maybe a little bit of cystic change. So, what do you call these back here? That's what it is. Like geodes? What? what do you mean? I'm not what sure. is this, this finding called? There are several different names for it. Uh, I'm not sure. What... They can be called radiation pits. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. They can be called pits pits. But they were well recognized by uh, victims. And actually, there are some people who felt that these were always abnormal. And there were some people who felt that these were so common to see that they're just normal variants. And so we see this, uh, you know, kind of subchondral subcortical cyst at the femoral head neck junction superiorly. So what's going on? Here? You would worry about a like a femoral acetabular impingement. Okay, and then you see bone marrow edema associated. Yeah. So edema makes it unlikely that it's a congenital variant. So early on, when we started looking at these, we actually found that they're often associated with acute changes, especially in younger individuals. Uh, so we fairly rapidly realized that, that these are probably not congenital variants, uh, but more likely uh, re chronic repetitive trauma. <laughs> and uh, that was one of the impetuses to start looking into uh, uh, impingement syndromes as a cause of these. And so uh, this was in the days when these were still called herniation pits. And then so they did a number of studies. Here's one study that was published more recently in skeletal radiology where they would put people in different positions to see whether you could actually get impingement uh, in this situation. So here we can see this is someone doing the splits. And you notice on their regular MR scan in a regular position, we can see that there is some uh, ebernation and erosion of the superior head neck junction of the proximal femur. And if you actually put them in the splits position, you can actually see the impact here between the uh, uh, the uh, acetabulum and the area where you have the herniation pit on the uh, on the femur. So now it's generally recognized that these are actually due to repetitive trauma and a form of of, of impingement. Uh, even though they, you could have normal anatomy, it's just that the patient puts their hip in abnormal positions, uh, which produce the impaction. Or you can have uh, abnormal anatomy with bumps in the bone, which causes impact, impaction earlier than you would otherwise expect. The bottom line is that when we talk about these impingements, most of them are probably acquired. And they're acquired because uh, the patients uh, do 
uh, physical either exercises or physical positioning, which cause you repetitive trauma. What happens when you get repetitive trauma is that you get bony reaction. And part of that bony reaction can be hypertrophic new bone formation in this location, which can produce a bump, uh, which is a signature of a CAM type of picture. But uh, that's uh, the mechanism. John, these kissing lesions, uh, wouldn't they be pa very painful when the patient does it? Uh, this particular patient that was in this study was not painful at all. And without an anesthetic. Without an anesthetic, yeah. Okay. That'd be interesting. Uh, so. Looks pretty thick. It's it's thick and probably because she does a lot of uh, activity that stretched it and, and it's uh, kind of repaired itself and become thicker. Yeah. So. So you see these a lot in gymnasts, and you see them in sports activities that require kind of unusual positioning of the hip. The most common one in sports really is hockey, where this is a very common uh, abnormality. And in fact, a lot of the literature looking at uh, uh, cam-type impingement in athletes it really initially came out of the hockey literature. Do you see a radiograph showing that? Would you see that as a possible etiology of, of a patient's pain if it's chronic? Hi, if I see that, I, I call it a herniation pit and say it's most compatible with chronic repetitive uh, impaction injury. That's the way I work. All right, so here we have a 12-year-old female dancer with increasing hip pain. Um, we see edema at the femoral head neck junction anteriorly. There is some irregularity of that bone. Um, I think there's some erosion and some mild bone marrow edema as well. I think this is secondary to chronic impaction or chronic microdrama. Um, and you can see some edema there um, at that junction. And honestly, it doesn't look too aspherical. Um, I think this is just normal morphology with the herniation pit. Um, and edema. Um, what I was going to ask, John, is have these been uh, measured for rotational abnormalities? I don't know. Because if, if, if they get impingement um, at this age, uh, there, there has to be something anatomically wrong, I would think. Well, I think this is very common in dancers. It's very common in gymnasts. And probably what's wrong is that they, they are hyper limber or they wouldn't be doing those sports. And they put themselves in positions where the body really wasn't designed to do it. The body really wasn't well, built to be a ballerina or a gymnast. I certainly agree with you. but uh, and, and I've seen that. But the thing is, it's painful. And um, then this one was painful. That's why they're getting the study. Yeah, this one is this one was painful. Uh, and, uh, that one that was. And yeah. That's edema there, isn't it? It is. It's edema in the bone, which is yeah. a pretty reliable indicator of symptoms. And so the question is: Is this a precursor to what we typically call FAI, which has develops a bump in this location, causing asphericity of the uh, femoral head? And my guess is this is probably if they continue to do this activity. Most a lot of people will get hypertrophic bone formation, but not everyone because not everyone's a big bone former and, and develop a classic FAI that we'll talk about. He's just a 12 year old, yeah, he's got a lot of time to do that, yeah, right? If it continues, right? Exactly, Jennifer. So, this is a 21 year old male with hip pain, rule out labral tear. Um, Here's another example where we can see that marrow edema along the anterior superior femoral head and neck junction. And there may be some early osseous remodeling on the first image. It looks like there may be some slight outward convexity. Um, this could be associated with repetitive microtrauma or impaction injury. Um, yeah. Yeah. What's, uh, what's microtrauma in the hip? Yeah. 
and uh, again, this is probably early on, but uh, many people feel that this is probably what we would see as a precursor to FAI if they continue their sports activity. Well, you have to remember, um, you're, you're putting two to three times your body weight on the hip when you're doing this, this um, activity. Uh, and the lever arm is long, so so that the, the force is quite uh, remarkable. That's why you're getting these lesions. Okay, so 33-year-old with bilateral hip pain on exercise. So first imagery of a CT where we see this uh, cortical irregularity along the anterior acetabulum, and it looks fairly well corticated with a small fragment, and there's some small marginal uh, femoral head osteophytes. Um, the capsule looks intact on the MRI, so I just assume this is just kind of, you know, pain on exercise, kind of chronic repetitive trauma with impingement impaction resulting in these injuries. Here's the axial. And on axial, you see there's kind of joint space loss posteriorly with osteophyte formation. And you see this large convexity bump on the anterior um, anterior femoral head neck junction. So this could be like some cam type femoral osteophyte impingement. This is what we'll see in the movement. This is probably a combination of cam and pincer. In the pincer, you typically get this posterior uh, inferior degenerative disease, uh, which we'll talk about when we go to the mechanism of the injury. And this is a typical hypertrophic bone formation that occurs uh, anteriorly uh, from chronic repetitive impaction injury. Uh, and that produces uh, the bump here and the, the femoral head is no longer completely spherical, and then so this bump can then catch on the anterior acetabulum producing the uh, impingement. But, but with this whole mechanism of injury, uh, what you can see here is that the, the traditional cam tap with the bump is kind of late in the disease process. It's not an early indication, and it's not, these are not thought to be congenital lesions. These are acquired lesions due to the uh, sports activity that they're doing and the trauma to the bone. Is it possible, John, that this um, patient had a slight slip? Uh, that's certainly possible. Uh, there could have been a little bit of a uh, uh, slip here uh, of the, the acetabulum that may be responsible for a little bit of the prominence here. And we see we see that the the a head, the epiphysis here, uh, does not really go out like it's supposed to anteriorly. So, John, I think I think that's a very good point. Is that a lot of these acetabulums uh, can be started by having a very subtle uh, slip capital femoral epiphysis when the when the patients were younger. Yeah, no, that, that, I think that. Yeah. That's a that's a very good point. There's a lot of these in in, in in the old days, and that's a very good point. I pick these up earlier now. Yeah. Okay, so I I'd, I'd like to stop here. I've got a meeting at at four o'clock.